remember that they'll be like I, uh, one time we were in a class and this guy was but talking. dude you know what like all the guys in the room were like yeah absolutely <laughs> like i could see it yeah, in their yeah. eyes they're like they were like thinking to themselves f yeah <laughs> you know what i mean you confirmed like, an instinct that they they didn't yeah. say those words because it wouldn't have been appropriate but like internally that's how they felt all right we're live on youtube okay <laughs> okay that's it's good to know let's Just yes so you know i would to go live on facebook okay What made me think of that is I said I would guard this box with my life. There we that, go. That was the that train of was thought. The, just in case you were wondering how we got here, that was the trigger. As his wife. Yeah. <laughs> okay. <clears throat> Don't insult the box. I, <laughs> I promise you, I will, that will not even come even close to my mind. Okay, good. But you think, like, right? I mean... Warning. The Catholic Man Show contains high levels of manliness. It's simple, really. You either want to grow in virtue and holiness, or you want to be a sissy, whiny baby. If you choose to move forward, grab your whiskey glass, because the Catholic Man Show is starting right now. Welcome to the Catholic Command Show. We're on the Lord's team, the winning side. So raise your glass. Adam Minahan here, sitting with David Niles to my right. To my left, we have a very uh, a special guest, a friend that I have. We have been trying our best to get on for about a year. We have to blame COVID for this. But luckily, we have uh, been able to get him on the show. Father Aquinas Gilbo, he is the prior of the Priory of Immaculate Conception, mm -hmm. and he is also uh, a frequent provider of content for the Thomistic Institute, Aquinas 101. Mm -hmm. It's great to have you here. Thank you, Adam. It's great to be here. I'm glad we were able to do this finally after a year. Yes, and you were, you gave a great uh, talk on the domestic church last night for the Alcuin Institute of Catholic Culture, which is a really cool part about like being here in the Diocese of Tulsa, like having the this institute. Uh, but and it was very well received. You know, we're finally getting to the point where people are interested in, in getting back together. So it's mm -hmm. just nice to have Catholics in a room together, eating and drinking and learning a little bit about our, our faith. No, thanks for that invitation too. It was a great event last night. Uh, nice to be able to make the connection between the House of Studies and the Domestic Institute and uh, and the Alcuin Institute. It's good to learn about you guys and uh, also just the amazing things that are happening out here in Tulsa. It was great to be in a full room last night and uh, and then at Mass this morning at uh, Holy Family Cathedral here in Tulsa. As I told you after Mass, it's been a year since I've seen that many people in church at one time. And so oh, wow. it, it's great to, uh, yeah, this has been a big a big boost uh, for me. So Is this your you. first trip to Tulsa? First what visit. What yeah. do you think of the cathedral? It's beautiful. I just love yeah, it. Yeah, I made a I gym out here in uh and, uh, yeah, the sanctuary is absolutely gorgeous. And, and the whole church, the windows, the I mean, all of the appointments, mm -hmm. it's its great. And it seems like you've got a great rector there, uh, other priests, deacons, and, uh, no, people who are on fire with the gospel. So it's great to it's great to be there this morning. So thank you. And I played a little bit of a uh, sales pitch on him that I didn't take him to Clear Creek Abbey on purpose this time <laughs> ah, so yes, that like we it, have right. to bring him back. There so are that other we can, things to you see. You will That's have to right. come back. Exactly. Yes. No, no, no. We're already planning the next trip, so thank you. Yes. Yeah. 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 So um, tonight we're gonna uh, we're gonna talk about temperance. We're gonna talk about uh, the virtue of temperance, and uh, we will imbibe in a little bit of a, a drink this evening. Temperately. Temperately. Yeah. Yes. Uh, Tor bag. Tor bag. Tor bag. Tor bag. Uh, this evening, I've never had this. I've never even heard of it, to be honest with you. In fact, I'm yeah. getting to the point where if I go to the Scotch Isle and I'm not familiar with one i just go ahead and grab it might as well because it's yeah. like oh this is one i've never heard of before mm -hmm. um you haven't heard of it either dave no uh but it's shaped by the uh, the island of sky it's a 2017 the legacy series it's a they say it's uh, aged in oak casks and it's smoke and brine is kind of the it has a little bit of p 
pe- temperately well peated is, is what it says. Is smoking brine part of the name or like the series I, or? I think it. I think just they're like just a, the a description, maybe just part of the description. Or mostly okay. a robustly peated and spirit with a deceptively refined characters, resulting in a complex and char- characterful merit uh, whiskey. The nose reminds me a lot of Ardbeg. Really? Well, yeah. it, the color even looks like Ardbeg. The color also looks like Ardbeg. Yeah, but then, even more nice. than that, on the nose, it's it's yeah. Ardbegian. Yeah, iodine. Yeah, it smell. So we're on the Lord's team. The winning side. So raise your glass. Cheers. Cheers to Jesus. Cheers. Cheers, Juan. Juan on the buttons this evening. Did I mention that? I'm sorry if I didn't, Juan. I apologize, but we're grateful for Juan. He's been a huge help this weekend as well. We are Sands Jim. He's uh, feeling a little under the weather, so he stayed home this evening. It is kind of. It is kind of like Ardbeg. It's a little sweeter and a little saltier. Mm. You know what I'm saying? Like, it kind of, the initial, uh, Father, are you familiar with Ardbeg? I'm not. It's a, it's a, it's a staple at my house because it's about $42. Okay. And very delicious. Uh, It's like real smoky, Mm -hmm. real peaty, heavy on the iodine. Exactly all of the things that, like, the gross stuff that you, <laughs> right. like, really treasure in a scotch. Well, when you put it together. Right, yeah, nice. exactly. Uh-huh. Um, so this kind of starts, to me, it starts off a lot. In, this is really good. In, in that is. same way, yeah. And I think, so I, I certainly think that people are going to be more familiar with Ardbeg 10 than they are with Torabeg. Mm-hmm. Um, but this has a sweetie, like a sweeter kind of up front um, and, and sal- definitely saltier. I do. I, I catch the salty. Yeah, yeah. I agree. Uh, and it's not that bad a price. I think it's about fifty five dollars. So it's okay. it, it's not bad. It's a great uh, if you like peated scotches. Mm-hmm. It's a medium length finish. I could. Um, it's not a short finish. Mm-hmm. I could go for a little bit of a mm-hmm. longer finish. Per you know, like. But um, I think it's really good. Yeah. Uh, I'd say nice. I'd say fifty five dollars is a fair price personally. Yeah. Uh, for those who may be just now listening, we're, we've, we've uh, added a couple of stations recently in Texas. Uh-huh. Uh, Dave, why don't you kind of – this will also bleed into our topic really well. Why, why are we sure. drinking on the show? Okay, so um, we drink on the show for a number of reasons. First, the, the, like the, the best reason is just because God made the things of this earth good, mm-hmm. and they should be enjoyed for their goodness. Um, there's also just something about having a drink, um, smoking a cigar – uh, you know, doing these what you might call stereotypically manly things, there's just something about them that facilitate a good conversation right. that help you enter into things beyond how the weather is. You know, um, when you start smoking a cigar, like you don't talk about the weather. Like, I don't know why. Unless it's raining and it's tough to start the right. cigar. And then you, and then you <laughs> that, just that. like, ah, oh. then you start talking <laughs> about like, why are we out here? Yeah, this is a bad idea. In the rain. <laughs> yeah. We, we must be fools, yeah. right? Um, but that's why we do it. It's just to facilitate good conversation um, and to promote, obviously, the virtue of temperance. Uh, it's one thing to talk about it. It's another thing to mm-hmm. do it. So, um, And if you're going to have a drink, you should have a, a really good drink, right? Mm-hmm. Um, enjoy it for, for its goodness and enjoy the craftsmanship right. of, exactly. of, a, of a drink. You know, we're not drinking a $12 bottle of whiskey. We're not going to have Bud Light on the show. Not that we're in like inherently against Bud Light. If if that is your, if you like, if you say, you know what, I've surveyed the landscape generally of, of beer, and Bud Light is the thing that you know does it really does it for me. Great, I think you have terrible taste. <laughs> <laughs> but go, you know what, right. you you do you, man, right. you do you. Uh, so anyway, that's why we're drinking, just because yeah. we're men, and it is good that we do these things. Father, so you enjoy scotch. I, I do. Uh, and you're, you a little bit of bourbon as bourbon well? Bourbon also. Yeah, we're... I mean, the Dominicans, we were founded in Kentucky. So right. The American Dominicans, we were founded in Kentucky, and so not very far from where mm-hmm. bourbon, bourbon was trail. born. Sure. And so, uh, no, early on, that was uh, the drink of choice for American Dominicans, and still is, uh, in, in a way. I do, though... Yeah, there are some of us uh, who have uh, expanded... You know, into the realm of scotch. I can't say I know a whole lot about it, but appreciate a good scotch like this one. So thank you. Yeah, absolutely. 
Uh, so what what do you guys got going on at the, at the Priory? What do you have going on at the Thomistic yeah. Institute? Why don't you just introduce yourself a little bit to our audience uh, for those of you who don't for those of them who don't know you? Okay, yeah. sure. So Father Aquinas Gilba, as you said earlier, uh, prior of the Dominican House of Studies in Washington D.C., which is our studium, we call it, or the seminary for the Dominicans of the Eastern Province of the United States. That's the province of Saint Joseph. There are four provinces uh, of Dominican friars in the states: East, Central west and south uh east central and west all have their own seminary their own studium ours in dc central province theirs is in st louis west coast out in oakland in the in the bay area um and uh, we're also a pontifical faculty uh which means that we grant degrees in theology on Mm. behalf of the holy see uh which is to say our graduates if they get the pontifical degrees they're they're church accredited teachers okay they, they can teach officially let's say in other seminaries or other pontifical faculties uh and since they have the, the church's seal of approval uh and so nice. half of our student body uh are our own men in formation of which we have probably about 55 to 60 men in formation no right kidding now in our province that's wow awesome. that sounds, that sounds yeah, great. all together that includes the novitiate <clears throat> um those uh, in simple vows, solemn vows, and those who are ordained deacons. So everyone before priesthood ordination. How long is the formation? It can last. uh, So it's a year of novitiate, three and a half, four years of simple vows, after which then would be diaconate and priesthood. So it could take about between, the average is six or seven years for, uh, for, uh, for formation. As a Dominican first, you make solemn vows and then proceed to ordination uh, after. Let me ask you this question. Mm-hmm. Um, a co-worker of mine, this is like back in the day when I worked in an office. Mm-hmm. Uh, now I work from home still. Uh, but a guy, he, he asked, because I'm kind of known around the office, at least I was, back when we had this thing called an office. Right. As like in the, the Catholic. Before times. Right, exactly. The before, the times. before times, right. right. I was kind of the Catholic guy. So right. if anybody had a question about Catholicism, they'd ask me, which I really actually mm-hmm. appreciate and like. But he asked me, what's the difference between a monk and a friar? Right. And I said, I think it's a terminology thing, but I don't really know. And right. what is the difference? So monk Benedictines would be monks. These are men who uh, take a similar vow of obedience under, which is understood, uh, you know, poverty and chastity, but they also take a vow of stability, which is they belong to one monastery for mm-hmm. for the rest of their lives. Friars was a term that was developed later for uh, the itinerant friars, which is to say those who make similar vows of obedience and poverty and chastity, but they they move around. They can be they can live in different communities over the course of their life, and so um, that's the a principal distinction between monks and monks and friars. Excellent. Awesome. All right, so we're here with Father Aquinas from the, the Priory of Immaculate Conception. We're going to talk about temperance on the other side of this break. We'll be right back. Okay, so I feel really good about what I told my coworker because I also told him that I think friars live like in the world and mm-hmm. monks live in a – yeah. So the monasteries are usually isolated, whereas the friars live in – in cities, is so the a, friars are the Dominicans, the Franciscans, Carmelites. They're um, they're all friars. The friars, yeah. Okay, so that is that's mm-hmm. pretty universal. Benedictines the are difference. monks. Yeah. Okay. Mm-hmm. So it's not just a terminology. It's not just like oh, they're not necessarily synonymous. I mean, there is a a real difference between. That's the monk right. We and wouldn't a friar. be called monks. They wouldn't be called friars. Okay. Yeah. And the word friar just comes from uh, frater, uh, brother. You know. Um, okay. They, they were the or frere in uh, in French. So mm-hmm. when I told my my coworkers that we had a Dominican friar coming to the church this weekend, one thought that he was like a deep friar <laughs> from the Dominican <laughs> Republic. That's right. <laughs> and it was a wonderful moment to like, okay, let's talk about the orders. Yeah, so it's not <laughs> like that. Yes. Yeah. Uh, yes. Well, I told uh, in DC some office i had to go register in or something like that and i she re- residence i said dominican house of studies she goes oh that's interesting you don't look dominican <laughs> and i was like oh okay now i know what you mean yeah, yes yeah. you're right uh, I, and i'm not that kind of dominican. that took that's me right. maybe two seconds <laughs> i sat there and was like what <laughs> you exactly look dominican like, that's exactly what dominicans look like <laughs> 
Oh, not the Dominican <laughs> she was thinking of. It was like uh, one of our, uh, our friends who listened to this so show uh, when he went to the first Latin mass. Uh-huh. Uh huh. He he, he he goes. That was really awesome, but they didn't even speak Spanish. <laughs> you know, <laughs> like I speak some Spanish. Right? I didn't hear any of it. Not a word. Right. Right. That's just some of the inside baseball lingo that we take for granted sometimes. Right. You know, when evangelizing and right. telling people about. Of course, everyone Different thing. should know who the Dominicans are. Well, yeah. uh, I agree. In in my experience, like people hear Friar, they're like, like from Rob, uh, Robin Hood, or uh, yeah, yeah, yeah Robin, something like uh, that. Friar, like Friar Tuck, Tuck, Tuck or something. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Does he carry a big club? Is he is he fat? <laughs> right. <laughs> the cookie jar. Some guy. of them the might be. Jar. I don't know. I mean, yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, Aquinas was yeah, was was, was known for not being in that slender. One, in the one picture of him, he's like, yeah. Do we have that? It's over there. Yeah, there it is. Yeah. He's large. Yeah. He felt so bad that he let, like, he wouldn't ride on his donkey, apparently. Really? Is that is that the story true? Is that a, a, a fable or, like, a wise tale? I don't, I mean, people tend to think, and the later depictions of him, uh, or that he's severely obese and stories about cutting the, you know, the, the circle in the table so that he can sit down. I think that's anti-Thomas propaganda from a later age totally. That's the, the early the earliest Jesuit descriptions they said he was large and had a noble head a noble that, head a noble yes. head whatever Indeed. that means <laughs> and I think he was just a large man uh, he definitely probably had taller a, than like a big brain so right. you know right but sense. I don't think he was uh, it would make sense unless he had some kind of health issue or something because he I mean he walked across Everywhere. Europe a couple of times right so you know yeah I, I think that never can't trust the Jesuit. No, no, Dave. <laughs> Actually, this would be Franciscan anti-Dominican propaganda, oh. I think. Well, really? some of those. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Some of the Franciscans before, before the Jesuits were even founded. Converted to Jesuitism. <laughs> <laughs> right. Franciscans, how, they were like a long time before the they, Jesuits? Yeah. Well, we I were, guess the Jesuits have only like 500 years or Yeah, so? it's just 16th century and Dominicans and Franciscans of 13th century. Okay. Yeah. They were our sparring partners before the Jesuits came around. <laughs> Welcome back to the Catholic Man Show. I'm David Niles. Here with Adam Minahan and Father Aquinas. Which is like the coolest name. <laughs> yes. You can thank my novice master for that. Is that who? Uh-huh. Okay. He made the decision. Yeah. Did, was that like a... Did you like kind of clinch? Like, right. Or, or were you like... Uh, what's, you, the, what's like? Is there a lot of pressure on you? You're like, oh, I'm Father Aquinas. Well, first, yeah, like it's cool. It's like, oh, but yeah. Then for the rest of my life, yeah, Aquinas. Hmm. Oh wow. Yeah, I got big shoes to fill. Yeah. <laughs> so tell me, you know. Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, big time. Do you think uh, Saint Thomas? Like, do you think he? You guys are the Dominicans, mm-hmm. but you're known. I mean, Saint Dominic was awesome, right? Like, awesome. Mm-hmm. But more people know who Saint Aquinas, Saint Thomas is than, right. than Saint Dominic. It's like, true. He kind of like overshadowed yeah. his, you know, the order. It is bit. true. It, it, I think it's part of the, the legacy that Saint Dominic has in the church. That it's not his biography. It's not his own hagiography. Not his own personal witness or sanctity. His legacy for the church is, is the order. You know, mm-hmm. it's, it's and the, the rosary. I mean, that's what that's I, right. That's what I think. Of. And so, in the order and its works of, of preaching, Marian devotion, but also uh, solid theology, just the intellectual life to uncover and defend the goodness of creation, <laughs> right? Yes. and the superabundant goodness of, of grace. I mean, that that's what. Mm-hmm. So he set up an, a way of life that was attractive for men, not only of his age but of our own. Uh, the goal of the Dominican life uh, is to be a good preacher, a a faithful son uh, of the church and a faithful preacher. It's not so much to be another St. Dominic. That's not the, that's not the goal. I think that's a way in which Dominicans are really distinct from, um, one of the ways in which Dominicans are really distinct from Franciscans. I think for a Franciscan to become a Franciscan is to to be St. Francis. I mean, to, to spend your whole life striving to imitate the virtue and the life of St. Francis. Whereas St. Dominic, hmm. when, when he died uh, in 1221, he was basically forgotten. <laughs> you know, he hmm. was buried in, in the church in Bologna, but then the friars just got on with it, you know, got on yeah. with life and, and didn't forget him, but there was no real cult of the founder. 
uh, hmm. in that sense. And so 15 years or so after the the death of the uh, of St. Dominic, uh, a friend of his who had been a cardinal uh, who helped him to establish the order himself becomes pope, is elected pope. And he's the one who goes to the the brethren of, of the day and say, you know, you guys should pay a little more attention to, <laughs> to St. Dominic. He was yeah. like my friend. I knew him. He was a holy uh, a holy man, and he should be recognized for his holiness. So you, you guys should probably start working on his canvas. <laughs> How about you know send me as send me the, some documents. As the, as the yeah, yeah. I'm telling I'm, you, I'm, I'd be happy to do this. And so that's that's how it got started. So it's not that uh, there's no love for Saint Dominic because there is. Uh, there's no. It's not that there's no appreciate appreciation for Saint Dominic because there obviously is. But it's well, sure. Um, but the the love of the founder really runs through love of of the order and, and what it is that he set up mm-hmm. that we share this common ideal of a way of life to dedicate oneself to Christ uh, but uh, but especially to his word and the study of his word and the preaching of his word and uh, and that's the gratitude that we we show to Saint Dominic is to yeah to live that life as together as as best we can. So I know we're here to talk today. We're going to talk about temperance, but I just mm-hmm. want to follow up on. What you've said, sure. Um, because is there something about the order uh, and the the order of the order mm-hmm. um, that you think allowed Saint Thomas to develop himself the way he did? Like, what if right. he was Benedictine or like right. something else? Because he, he almost was. Yeah, right? That's right. Right. Exactly. That was his family's plan. Well, right, right. That's what I mean. He, I, I don't want to say probably, but he might not have been the saint been you know like uh himself in the fullness Mm -hmm. that he was so is there something in your opinion Mm -hmm. that allowed him to be that way because of the order because he was a dominican right there i think there was i think uh, early dominicans uh, discovered him as a kind of talent as a young man down at the university of naples um, he agreed to enter the order. That's when his family tried to kidnap him and <laughs> keep him from going. But but they recognized in him uh, a particular genius early on, sent him to study under St. Albert the Great, uh, and then put him on the fast track in Paris to become a master of theology. Uh, and then once he, he attained those those honors and those credentials, then he began to work at the after a series of assignments for the order itself to, to organize studies within the order, to organize centers of study for the order. Uh, and in that, uh, he was given time, space uh, to, to study, to write, uh, and really to develop uh, the novel approach to 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 study, to theology, to preaching that, that, that he did, which is redounded to the, the benefit of the whole church. So, so there, there was something, a short answer to your question, uh, about the order and its governance and the way assignments work, uh, um, you know, just the prudence of his own superiors at the time, you know, sure. allowed oh, for yeah. him to, to develop uh, this, this gift uh, for, for theology, for preaching. What I was really thinking, you know, if you're a Benedictine, you just don't have time. There's not a, as much time to study, mm-hmm. right? You're, you're devote, vo- devoted more to the contemplative life mm-hmm. and to prayer. So is there something like a balance between in the, in the Dominican order? I think, think this was the genius of St. Dominic. That's what he saw, that in his day uh, there was a dearth of preachers and a dearth of preaching. Uh, this had to change. Uh, and preaching for cities and people in cities. Mm-hmm. Uh, and so he knew from his own life that the monk is the kind of the perfect prayer the 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 monk teaches the christian how to pray and that has to be the foundation of of preaching and study uh and so that was dominic's instinct that to form a a city preacher you basically had to take the monk out of the country monastery put him in the city and take the shovel out of his hand (laughs) because that's what he was doing (laughs) most of the day and you put a book in his hand and uh, and so that's you have this city monk, this city preacher, uh-huh. um, who dedicates himself, consecrates himself to prayer, and to study of the word. But his work is study, uh, learning, teaching, uh, and preaching. Beautiful, yeah, beautiful. So we're we're going to talk about temperance, and this kind of actually yeah. dovetails right into what we're going to talk about—the order of of you know you know when we're talking about temperance, we're talking about governing and ordering our appetites. Mm-hmm. Uh, for for a uh, order that is uh, brings about peace, that brings about uh, tranquility, that brings about uh, the fullness of man. Mm-hmm. Uh, 
when we talk about appetites, maybe we should start with definitions. Sure. Uh, what are what are appetites and what are the types of appetites to, to govern? So appetite is just a word we use for that power in us that uh, that desires the good. Uh, so that's the movement in us, uh, which is a complement to reason. So intellect is that uh, that power by which we bring reality into ourselves mm -hmm. and hold reality uh, in ourselves through the acquisition and possession of truth. Uh, appetite is that power that by which we move out of ourselves into the world to actually grasp that which we know to be true. And because we know it to be true, we also recognize it to be good. And it's under the aspect of good that we desire it and love it uh, and pursue it, possess it, and enjoy it. Um, now, we have two kinds of appetite in us, the rational appetite, which is the will. That's the appetite that's directly linked to, to intellect. So mm -hmm. we call it the intellectual appetite or the rational appetite. It's the appetite of our intellect. So that which we know to be true by intellect, we, in a sense, desire intellectually by love. Uh, but we also have the sense appetites, which is those power, that power in us to desire. These are the passions. These are the emotions that, that follow upon not reason directly, but our senses. So once we see or smell or hear or touch something pleasant, mm -hmm. it becomes desirable. Mm -hmm. <laughs> passions right, move sure. in, in desire for them. And so we, have, we sense within ourselves and feel within ourselves two, two kinds of appetite, the, the rational appetite, the will which is by the power by which also we choose, uh, and also the, the sense appetites, the, the passions by which um, yeah, we, in a sense, hunger for uh, the pleasurable good. And they, a lot of times I think people uh, mistakenly think that temperance and moderation are, are, mm -hmm. are, are interchangeable. Uh, yeah, and they can be they can they, be synonymous in certain circumstances, right? But Yeah, I mean, but people are in Fort Connor four cardinal virtues which we've talked about on the show many times yeah. uh, the very like the very first thing he talks about is how that is a mistake mm -hmm. um maybe we maybe you can expound on that yeah i would say that uh i'd have to look again closely at what people are, well i mean the, just the mistake he, he wants to avoid uh i would say that i think we can say that um temperance has a uh, a moderating function in, mm -hmm. in life it, right. it uh it's work in us to perfect our sense appetites is to uh, moderate their movement, which is to say to make sure they move rightly in accord with reason. Mm -hmm. That the sense appetites, especially that appetite which we call the concup concupiscible appetite, which is the that's the movement of passion in us that desires the the pleasurable, sensible good. Food, so, sex, exactly, play. and those are the big ones: the the the, the good of drink, of food, yeah. the good of drink, and the good of of the marital union, sexual pleasure, and so those uh, are. You know the the principal objects of the concupiscible appetite. Temperance enters in to perfect that appetite, to to regulate, to moderate its motion, so that we desire the good of food, the pleasure of food that we desire, the pleasure of drink that we desire, the pleasure of sex, according to right reason, and that we desire it not excessively, but also not defectively. So it, it mm -hmm. could be that you you don't desire these things enough. <laughs> right. Yeah. Sure. It, but. In most cases, if we have a problem with the concupiscible appetite, it's right, because yeah. it's it's a little overactive right. <laughs> and needs a little moderation in that sense. That and that, and my that's, experience. Right? <laughs> that's, uh, that, that's the work of uh, the work of temperance. I don't. It's been a, over a year since I've read the Four Cardinal Virtues, but I want to say that he was saying that uh, temperance is more than just moderation. That's right. 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 It's that's not right. that they're not. There's a lot of overlap, but right. that they're not. Uh, Equivalence, right? You know you know, I mean? Moderation is is the act of temperance, right? And the temperance go it does go beyond moderation because there are some things where yeah, if moderation has a kind of negative aspect to it, that would people is going to say Thomas is going to say that temperance helps us to feel rightly, you know, yeah, mm. and yeah, that yeah. it's not a danger, or something to be avoided, but in fact can be enjoyed perfectly, right? Perfect. Yeah. All right, so we'll, we'll we'll pick this up on the other side of the break. We'll be right back. That's exactly what it was. I'm sorry. I didn't mean yeah, to like yeah, set yeah. you up there mm -hmm. without no, no, no. uh cuz that's all I was trying to mm -hmm. distinguish. Um do you like do you like Peter? Yeah, yeah. Okay. He's everybody should read more. <laughs> In fact, I saw there was a decal online I found the other day it just said read more Peter. <laughs> that was for me. Was it you? Okay. That was for me. Was it? Yeah, yeah. Yes. All right. It's like a like a 70s kind of script. Yeah. 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 Read more Peter. I you? still have not gotten back on after uh Lent. Uh-huh. I'm not coming back. Just not gonna do it. I'm not gonna do it. 
I'm not going back to Twitter. I'm not going back to Twitter. I'm not going back to Facebook. I'm not. I'm just. I'm not. I'm yeah. Not. Welcome. I'm really sorry. <laughs> like, <laughs> That's what I've been. So welcome. Yeah. You know you what have I mean? to say like, goodbye to all your friends now. Yeah, the yeah. truth is, Adam, I wasn't doing anything before. <laughs> okay. Like I didn't help you with it all. So like. <laughs> It's not that big of a loss for you. Maybe every now and then I'll check in. Maybe. There's part of me that thinks Facebook is the is the is the superior platform, right? Because it allows for more discussion and it does seem to be more family friendly, friend friendly, you know, mm-hmm. uh because yeah. it does connect people in that way. Twitter, yeah, is deficient in those terms because of the you know, the the short tweets and there's less the hot multimedia. takes that everybody wants to and make. it invites that kind of thing mm-hmm. but i find it yeah. difficult to pull myself from twitter to go back to facebook because it just twitter's just so easy right <laughs> yes i know it's a path of least resistance like if yeah. i hang on to one it's going to be twitter not right, because right. i want to tweet right but because i find it more useful right like you can get right news you know it's like right like I just don't care about anything that's happening on Facebook. <laughs> like there are some things on Twitter. It's like, oh, I found that interesting. Right. I'll learn stuff like, on Twitter. Uh, yeah. The Babylon Bee, I don't know if they have a Facebook account. Maybe they do, and I just right. don't follow them. But I do follow them on right. Twitter, which makes my Twitter account <laughs> more valuable. Because <laughs> they are I follow hilarious. the Babylon Bee on my Twitter they account. They are hilarious. It's like, yeah. maybe I'll just unfriend, I'll unfollow everybody. <laughs> there you go. Except for them. <laughs> and then... Like Twitter, it's just be like, ah, you guys gotta get Twitter. Right, right, right. <laughs> <laughs> that uh, is part of it. Just yeah, calling periodically, follows yeah. and stuff like yeah, that. Yeah, yeah. I mean, like nobody follows me. I don't. Nobody follows me. I put it on there. It's like I'm the worst. Don't follow me. Right. Like, <laughs> I don't. And people still do. I still yeah. get emails. It's like, like you had five people follow you. I don't know why. Right. You know, like, All right. In my bio, it literally says, I'm the worst, the worst Twitter. Twitter follow of all time. <laughs> I told you that. Well, people take that ironically and think, this is an invitation to no, follow right. you. No, I'm not. There's, there's I'm, no irony here. I do other things ironically, but that's not one of them. If you can rotate his mic more a little bit towards oh. him. There, there, right. there right there. Beautiful. Okay. Thank yeah. you, Juan. See, that's why we have one of the many reasons. Uh, the technical Juan. master. Fa- father got a chance to have tacos at Juan's house today. Mm-hmm. Oh, Anything, any Real food, you, any food you eat at his house is awesome. I'll never go to Taco Bell again. <laughs> <laughs> You're welcome. Mission accomplished. Huh? <laughs> yeah. Actually, I've just probably been years since that's happened. Yeah. But yeah. yeah Joseph yeah. Pieper talks about extreme realism. Okay. I think my tacos are like the extreme realism <laughs> version of the fulfilled. I was wondering where you were going really, with this. I was does like, does he really talk about extreme realism? Yeah. We well, use his quote. Wouldn't, wouldn't that be time, like an anti-realism? Like, can you have? An extreme reality? Like, isn't it just reality? It's really real. Either it's, it's just real really or it's real. not real? It's the platonic form of taco. <laughs> <laughs> it either is or it isn't. Right. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Welcome back to the Catholic Man Show. Sitting here with Father Aquinas... Talking about temperance, Father, I think maybe we start by with maybe concupiscible appetites. We mm-hmm. Focus on that maybe a little bit more. Sure. Because that's probably what most men are struggling mm-hmm. to uh, govern. Sure. Uh, and so... So let's say what the concup- concupiscible appetites are. Okay. I'll let you... You you probably can do it better than I can. Yeah. So in the sense appetites, we can just make one general distinction between the basically two basic movements uh, that we experience in our passions, the irascible mm-hmm. and the concupiscible. The irascible is that, that contending side of our sense appetites that when we encounter some danger or some roadblock between us and a good that we're, we're striving for, uh, that can you know, produce uh, frustration and anger. Uh, it can produce fear you know, mm-hmm. if, the, if the danger is in fact uh, threatening you know, to us. Um, so and let's say so, someone insults your wife. No, <laughs> <laughs> this is a po- no. no it, 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 we're not going there. We're Just not going kidding. there. Just kidding. Or the Blessed Mother. Yeah. There we go. Yes. Uh, right. yeah. Yes. That's another one I was thinking. Have you read The Ball on the Cross? No, I haven't. Oh, no. It's a great book. Short G.K. Chesterton book. This will only take like five seconds. The whole premise is that there's this guy from Scotland who goes to London, and there's this atheist newspaper who's printing like insulting things about Our Lady, and he like breaks the window and jumps through and challenges this guy like to a duel to the death because like 
no one talks about my le-, you know or my right. my mother that way and it's like it's just awesome <laughs> it's, it's, it's so fun i have to pick that up it's like yeah. the easiest chesterton book i think that probably that there is that so. he wrote yeah well thanks for the recommendation yeah the, um, ball, and, the ball and the cross the ball, the ball and the cross. cross yeah so on the irascible side yeah we, you can uh yeah it's fear anger there's also daring you know that uh that and that's all what fortitude you know the the yeah. cardinal virtue of fortitude moderates just to make sure that we don't you know by excess or defect uh fear or get angry or you know in our daring uh fall away from the right pursuit of the of the good that we're seeking simply because there's some kind of danger roadblock you know, mm-hmm. there. So that's what fortitude, uh, its its work is to, to moderate in us the, the irascible appetite. Then there's also the concupiscible appetite. So the irascible contends with danger or, uh, or hindrances to the good. Uh, the concupiscible side is that, that uh, those passions that, that draw us towards that which is pleasurable. Mm-hmm. Uh, so pleasurable goods sensible pleasurable goods are things that just naturally attract us uh and uh and those can be of all the senses sight smell uh taste hearing but especially touch for aquinas he says that the the ones that that we're, we're really that the passion really moves for is the the the, the pleasures of touch and there he puts food and mm-hmm. drink uh there's definitely sex, a, the, a, the big three a higher sense of reality mm-hmm. in the you know when you t- you know if you see something right. Um, it could be an illusion. Right. You know, it's hard to be uh, illusioned by things that mm-hmm. you, you can touch. No, I think today uh, we really put a, 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 a priority on sight. You mm-hmm. know, if you ask somebody what, which sight would you fear most to lose, probably what sense, they yeah. would. They were, uh, they were, it's, okay, I'm yeah. sorry. What sense you, you would most fear to lose? And probably people would probably say sight because we're such a visual culture right. mm-hmm. today, especially through mass media. But the ancients and the medievals and most of Western tradition understood that the the, the sense that we rely on most and uh, and uh, and employ most is touch. Mm-hmm. Um, that that's that's where we come in in the sense, as you said, with contact with with reality. That right. confirms for us what the other senses tell us, mm-hmm. uh, and it's also the sense by which we we feel things that are nice <laughs> and pleasurable right, right. and give us joy, and uh, and so. That those passions that that uh, orient us and incline us towards the enjoyment of the pleasure goods can can be excessive or or defective, and it's the work then of of temperance to 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 moderate those such that we desire those goods in a right way, or that, and this is the usual problem with us that when we encounter or sense a pleasurable good, that passion in us for those goods don't stir up in such a way that leads us to the immoderate or irrational pursuit or enjoyment of that good. And so that could be gluttony in terms of food, uh, drunkenness in, in terms of drink, or um, of lust in, in mm-hmm. terms of the immoderate, irrational desire for sexual pleasure. So let me ask you this question. This is, a, I'm not, this is not a leading question. Mm-hmm. I really am asking you this. Are the virtues, um, I don't want to say absolute, but um, are, are the virtues truly relative like per person or Mm -hmm. uh, is there like a real virtuous amount that should Mm -hmm. be universal right Mm -hmm. and so i'm thinking of alcoholism you know somebody obviously the right thing for someone who is an alcoholic is to not drink Mm -hmm. um however while that might be the best thing for them to do that is that still a lack of virtue in that they're not able to drink temperately or is that temperance itself? You know what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. Like, what is the answer to that question? Complex. <laughs> okay. But it's a good question, and it's one that we do have to wrestle with, uh, just in terms of coming to greater clarity as to what the virtue does and what we should expect the virtue uh, to do for us. So, in answer to your first question, it, it's yes and no. Is there, are there objective standards of, mm-hmm. the, of the virtue, let's say, of temperance? Yes, insofar as for everyone, temperance is going to moderate the sense appetites. Yeah. They're going to help us achieve the mean between excess and defect. So that's going to be the same for everyone. What isn't the same for everyone is what the mean is between excess and defect. Mm-hmm. So for a five-year-old girl 
you know, the measure of food that's rational exactly. for her to eat different. is going to be different than a 35 year old man. Now, I don't know if you met Adam's dad. I did. did. Yeah, he did. Okay, so obviously yeah. he's going to eat more than a five-year-old girl. <laughs> that's you know right. What I'm saying like, exactly by a lot. He but eat the five-year-old. Girl. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> now each is perfected by temperance, but that's going to look different, you know, for each of those two people. Uh, same thing with drink. You know, some mm-hmm. people have uh, just a greater tolerance. Uh, uh, I've got uh, you know uh, friars in my house of of Korean descent, and because of of something particular about Asian genetics, they they just don't. Uh, process alcohol in the same way as mm-hmm. as we do, and so he just can't, you know, uh, just gets physically ill, you know, if oh, uh, really? if, if that if is a bummer, drinks alcohol, bummer. and so uh, so what's rational for him, what's temperate for him, is no alcohol, mm-hmm. you know, simply because he can't, he mm-hmm. can't have it. Right. Uh, uh, it'd be imprudent and irrational for him uh, to uh, <laughs> to choose, in fact, to to drink it. I think you can deal with with addiction in the same way. I think it would fall under the the similar category that. If for some kind of physical or psychological challenge, um, the, the presence of alcohol in one system uh, causes one uh, effects that aren't natural, let's say, to, to alcohol itself, well, then the prudent thing would be, you know, to avoid it, just to avoid whatever illness certainly, or, certainly. or bad mm-hmm. effects would, would come from it. Uh, and temperance would there be there as, as the virtue to, to regulate the, the passion so that when presented with alcohol, one doesn't uh, experience in themselves immoderate desire, you know, for it because their desire is, is shaped by reality. Like this is in itself good, but bad for me, and therefore, right, I don't desire it, right, you know. And that that's the sign of uh, of temperance. Temperance. That's why I don't drink milk. There you go. Personally, <laughs> yeah. yeah, it's bad for me. I'll tell right. you, yeah. it's bad for everyone. Yeah, and don't have a, probably a desire for it when you see it. No. Yeah. So does that mean like? Is that a good sense, like whenever you know, when you feel like that you're, you kind of governed your senses of of that appetite, when you don't even entertain that idea, you've just mentally already said like, nope, this right. is not good for me. Right. So like when Venerable Matt Talbot, he realized he couldn't drink. He didn't ever walk by the bar anymore because he just realized, nope, that's not an option for me. Right. Um, I'm not even going to entertain that idea. Right. And there are ways to do that. So, I mean, that... St. Thomas is, is uh, keen here to make a distinction between, let's say, continence and the virtue. So continence is the, it's like an imitation of the virtue. It's, it's getting us towards the virtue. It's the one who recognizes that this is bad for me, uh, but when I see it, boy, I still want it. Right. You know, uh, and I want it a lot. <laughs> like, you know, dark chocolate. <laughs> right, exactly. And because it's bad for me, I know it's bad for me. So an act of the will keeps me from from uh, from indulging, uh, but you know the the appetites, the passions are still stirring. That's a sign that we don't quite have the the virtue yet. But by an act of continence, I can you know refrain from enjoying that good, uh, and that keeps me in the realm of right reason. You know, I'm still acting rightly and prudently, even though I don't feel yet in myself that uh, that the <laughs> the virtuous thing is is in fact what my my passions want. Do you yeah. think temperance is the most difficult of all the virtues? I think we find it to be the most tem- the most difficult because uh, because it affects in us, I mean, real sensation, <laughs> right? You mm-hmm. know, and because those sensations are so present to us, so the sensation of like say hunger, or the pleasure of food, uh, thirst, and the the pleasure of drink, um, you know, the desire for for love uh, and the marital union. Uh, obviously, Aquinas, you know, says is the most intense of, of, of the physical pleasures. Um, the work then uh, to, to regulate and to moderate and to to make the, the movements of those passions rational and even our des- enjoyment of those pleasures rational. Uh, yeah, we find that taxing, you know. Uh, we don't find working for justice as uh, physically demanding. <laughs> right, right. It's like growing in... In, in abstinence or uh, or or chastity, right? Yeah, because uh, like with um, oh, what's the one where you like you're like putting yourself in bodily harm? The virtue fortitude. Fortitude. Thank mm-hmm. you. Yes. Yeah. Um, like I understand that, like putting myself at the point of the sword. That's not a good for me. It's not right, good right. for me. <laughs> I'll do it if I have to. Right. Right. You know. Yeah, yeah. But so I have no like disordered desire like let's do that again right like, that was cool right yeah, your like, daring is not nope. out of proportion right yeah. but you know like when when you're encountering a bowl of m&ms 
is it seven or eight right. M&Ms? Or 20? Times five. Yeah, right. right. Yeah, like, <laughs> or is it 21? You know, right. well, if you had 21, why not 22? No, when we get into these kinds of debates, internal yeah. debates with ourselves. That's an that, indication, right? And that, that we're not, yeah, we've not acquired the virtue yet. Yeah. <laughs> oh, I definitely haven't. <laughs> no way. <laughs> we'll be right back. Hmm. This is good. I like it. Mm-hmm. So this is the last segment. Okay. Uh, should we focus on uh, our touch raspable appetites and then focus on ways to build up temperance? Or what do you think? What that's, what I was, that's what I was going to yeah. move into. Yeah. Another thing it might be good to talk about, uh, that this is where Aquinas brings up the uh, his whole discussion of beauty. Hmm. Um, mm-hmm. And it's very, I think it's, it's profound what he has to say about, um, yeah, that there's uh, one of the things you need in order to grow in temperance is shame, which is to say you're repulsed at the disgraceful thing, but also what he calls honestas, which is the desire for beauty. Um, and that that's a found, those two are foundational to grow in temperance. And what he sees in, in the temperate act, when passion moves in accord with reason, uh, that's a beautiful thing. And th- that itself is desirable. Uh, and we can appreciate that. Uh, and then that beauty extends then even to the, the movements of the body. So the, the way we eat, the way we drink, uh, the way we play sports, or just everything that we do acquires once even the our movements match kind of the movements of the passion but also are regulated by reason that, that you you achieve beauty um, and I, I think that's profound uh, and it's it's what comes up you here. achieve uh, beauty yeah. yeah you become beautiful not only good but you become beautiful not me father <laughs> <laughs> my wife there not you me. go <laughs> that's why I've got her there you go <laughs> She's helping you. She's yeah, 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 a lot. That's why I take her around with me a lot. I mean, yeah, yeah. she's carrying it. Right. Oh yeah. Yeah. Big yeah. Time. Yeah. No doubt. But it's the difference between like Tiger Woods golf swing and like mine. Right. Mm-hmm. Okay. Yeah. You know that I understand. Yeah, I mean, yeah. I've not seen you swing a club. But hey, well, you I don't also want to. I yeah, swing yeah. a club, and I know what you mean. Between my playing basketball and LeBron. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> did a, did Aquinas actually say though that the intellect, like knowing things, was actually more pleasurable than? The sensible Ultimately, pleasure. yes. Ult- so, like, how does that work in, in form of temperance? Because mm-hmm. there are going to be times where you're... Well, temperance is are the... Well, certainly um, fortitude and temperance are the virtues necessary to allow justice and then prudence and the higher intellectual virtues to, to function because then they won't be interrupted by flare-ups of the passions. So until you get... And curiosity, the vi- you know, you can have the vice of curiosity. Exactly, and that comes up in temperance, that the, yeah, there's a pleasure in learning new things. Mm-hmm. So he actually says that no- acquiring knowledge is, is pleasurable. more pleasurable than the irascible appetites, is that... Or, or the concupiscible, concupiscible. Sorry, or, or sensible the pleasures, concu- that's right. Yeah, okay. We may not feel them as intensely, but they're ultimately more satisfying. That's why the contemplative can sit there and read for hours... And like forget to eat. <laughs> so are do does he, was, are pleasurable and satisfying? Would they are those synonymous in, in the uh, way he uh, is referring uh, to him there? They're probably there's a distinction to be in that made moment. There. But um, yeah, they're less felt, but ultimately more satisfying. Okay, if that, if that makes sense. Sure. Yeah, they're not felt in the in the senses or in the body. That's just but so they're funny. Experienced in the soul as delightful. I think like almost everybody on the face would disagree mm-hmm. you know uh you know just like if you just go take a poll uh, yeah but if you think it, if you start thinking no, about it well i'm just saying like if you go out into the po- into the population and you poll people like which is more pleasurable acquiring knowledge or you know eating dr- i mean like all right, of these right. other i think 99 percent of people are going to say acquiring knowledge is less satisfying is less pleasurable right um and maybe that's a sign of the times you know yeah. uh I would say I don't know. Uh, people I, can, people can sit and scroll on Twitter for a while, and oh yeah, that's you true. Know. Yeah, I think it's and that's all do... bur- built on the novel. I mm-hmm. mean, I'm acquiring just novelty over mm-hmm. and over and over. Yeah, I think it has to do with when you experience a pleasure a bodily, it goes away when you stop experiencing, but knowledge just stays there and you can dwell on it and you can build and f- just get really mm. more more passionate about it. So it's more pleasurable on the long run mm-hmm, mm-hmm. because sure. it lasts for a long time. Yeah. 
Yeah, but there's a uniqueness there of learning it initially. The endorphins that are released whenever mm-hmm. you like learn something new, even though you can carry it and, and, and play that out throughout your life, the newness wears off even if you know it. Mm-hmm. You know, I guess if you rephrase the question, even for the average person, you say, would you rather eat this piece of chocolate or have an epiphany? Uh, I think that would be mm-hmm. drastically different right. results. I mean, it's like, oh, I'd rather have an epiphany. That mm-hmm. would be awesome. I love it when that happens. Right. Yeah, I mean, even when, even when they're like mentally in anguish, sometimes that's a greater burden than physical ang- uh, like anguish, right? You know, sometimes people are like banging their head literally up against the wall to feel something to take away the mental anguish that they have. Mm-hmm. Meaning, ment- like the mental capacity is is more intense than the physical. Sure. I would much rather uh, physically be hurt from like. It, it, to save my family than like mentally have to like work through that for yeah. my family. And sure. there's a connection between the two because I, Aquinas says, yeah, if you're depressed or sorrowful, uh, take a bath. <laughs> yeah. Have, have some a wine. glass of wine. Yeah. 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 So, I mean, he sees Does he that, actually that, say that though in the Summa? I looked that up and I could not find it. It may not be there. Uh, I don't think it's in the Summa. It may be somewhere else. Cause somebody, people quote it from the Summa, mm-hmm. like take a bath. I mean, uh, you know, uh, have, go, a, have a good night's sleep. Now that you say it, I'm going to doubt myself. I'll, I'll spend no, no, no. five hours tonight looking for it. Yeah. <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm sorry. And I'll forget to eat I'm, because I'm, I want to know. Yeah. <laughs> Matthew Fratt, he, he he did a whole episode about it. Oh, he did? Yeah, and he, I don't Matthew remember. Fratt, are you on a uh, formal basis yes, with him? Yeah. Yeah, I didn't he, realize he and I that are, you are on a formal. I remember way before, I mean, way back before he was Matt. I mean, <laughs> yeah, okay. I didn't realize. <laughs> yeah. I know him. Very good. I know the real Matthew. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> right. Sweet. Yeah. But he, he did an episode on it, and he, I don't remember where it was, but he he said where it was from. Oh, okay. Yeah. It's definitely not a- All uh, I know is that I tried to look it up, because I, I just felt like- Sure. If he said- There are a lot of things by the saints. That or, people- that, Right. People no, should be the saints, And this right? is the bad thing about Facebook and Twitter. Right. Yeah. right. And, I like, <laughs> and I couldn't find it, at least in the Summa. Now, he may have said it in the- uh, country con- I don't, know. I don't or remember something where he said else, it. but but where would it be? You know, if Matt Frad is talking about it on his, he he's uh, he's, he's a good source, right? I th- I, th- I think he is a good so- a good source, and especially now that he's brought Father Gregory Pine, another Dominican, into the mix, yeah, right. Do Boom. You know, do you know Father Pine? I he yeah. was uh, in my yes, in my same. priory, yeah, yeah. For okay, you are. Several I, years. I didn't know, mm-hmm. like, but he's now in Switzerland and doing doc- Switzerland, Switzerland, yeah. Ooh, nice. He's that doing. <laughs> he's doing. Uh, he's uh, he's doing doctoral studies at the University of Fribourg, which is where a lot of us in the province go for for doctoral studies to study Saint Thomas more deeply. Do you like speak English with a funny accent over there? That's what I would do. Well, I think we speak French with a funny accent. <laughs> oh, do you speak French? Well, we're uh, the, the faculty in which we study is a French, French francophone. Uh, do you speak faculty. French? I've picked up a few things. Yeah. He's from Louisiana, so okay. he probably at least. A I bit. grew up hearing a lot of it. Didn't you learn do not much. sound like you're from Louisiana. No. If I'm, if we were down in, I know people from Bayous, Louisiana, and they do not. And I would you sound, do not sound a little. Sound like they do. I'd sound a little different than I do now. Okay. I was just down there in February, sure. and yeah, sentences comes, become shorter. Yeah, comes back. This the is O's kind of go out long, longer, oh, longer lots of longer, right. yeah. longer yeah. vowels and. Carlo Bussard. Yeah. <laughs> That's right. Yes. Uh, one time I was helping my cousin move back from Miami to Oklahoma, and we stopped in Louisiana at a gas station. Mm-hmm. And I went inside to get something from the snack aisle because uh, it's a long trip. And a guy who worked there said something to me mm-hmm. three times. Oh, yeah. And after the third time, he repeated it, and I still had no – I mean, it was like – it was zero progress was being made. Finally, I just, it sounded like, ha, blah, 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 blah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. You know, I just said, no, thanks. <laughs> and walked, I didn't know what else to do. <laughs> and like, just, I, yeah, I could tell it's not going to happen. Bro. I was down it's in, it's not going to happen. I was at, for, at a first mass or an ordination down in uh, Homa, Louisiana, which is way down the bayou, uh-huh. closer to New Orleans. And there was uh, a guy there from Scotland. When, and I heard him speaking off to the side at the reception. And I'm like, what language is that? And it took me a minute. He's speaking English. (laughs) And then later in the day, I'm walking down the street and I could see him. He's in a store trying to buy something. 
and I, I go in there because I, I can see on the, the, the clerk's face that they have no idea I, I don't what's know. going uh, on. I don't know. So I, I stand in the middle of them and translate English to English, <laughs> you know, back and forth just so they can, you know, affect this exchange. Yeah. How funny. That's Louisiana. Yeah. That's a good story. And I found the, I think I found the quote. Okay. Does it say wine? Does it have wine in it? Uh, it says, uh, where is it? Yeah, by sleeping in a bath. Right, but does it bring up the oh, glass of wine? wine? Well, we can look at is that. that. Because that's 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 what they quote. They say like uh, a, a bath, a good sleep, and a glass of red wine. Yeah, as I recall, they may be combining that they were different. different they were from different things. Like okay, um, it's like on the one hand he's saying have a bath, and uh, like on the other hand he's saying like an, uh, a rem a, is have a glass of wine. Mm-hmm. Okay, maybe that's how I. Maybe that's why I missed it. Maybe not together. Yeah, but he does re- recommend both. I see. Okay, fair enough. I just didn't see it when I was looking because I looked yeah. it up in a in a phrase of the the bath, uh, the sleep and yeah. wine all together. Right. Every pleasure assuages sorrow. Sorrow is assuaged by such like bodily remedies. So it's not just you know those two, but yeah, nice. Because that's the meme. Right. You know. I sleep and I woke up again. Found my grief. Not a little assuaged. That's Ambrose. Ambrose is good. He was pretty So good. but this is in the prima pars when he deals he's looking at the the passions individually and the remedies for sorrow or pain. Contemplating the truth, friendship, crying. Yeah. Tom's a big softy. Big, you know, a big sensitive man. You know, Adam and I are taking a Latin class, so like mm-hmm. we basically speak Latin. <laughs> nice. Did he tell you that? <laughs> I told him about the uh, Latin I saw class the, part. Uh, yeah, I saw the the blue uh, ecclesiastical Latin. Yeah. Book. Yes. Mm-hmm. If you limit it's your Latin to like majority one, of, one of twelve words, we are fluent. Right. <laughs> <laughs> but don't ask us to conjugate of them all. No, it needs to all be <laughs> right. yeah. present, active, indicative. Right. And then we got That's it. That's how my French is. It's ridiculous. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Man, you are good. <laughs> all right, you ready? Yes, yes, yes. Juan is over there giving us the... Although we recently... Was it imperfect? It was like the bomba spot? Like, yes. Oh, that's my new favorite. Uh, <laughs> like, it's all the same, no matter yeah, what. It doesn't oh, yeah. matter which one, yeah. Always bomba spot. Bamus batis bant. bant. Yeah, bant. Bant. Yes. Oh, nice. I'm only going to talk about stuff that way in Latin. <laughs> Things that like were happening. <laughs> Welcome back to the Catholic Man Show. I'm David Niles. Here with Adam Minahan and the Father Aquinas. The. Not A, but the. The Father Aquinas. Is there another one? There are. No. Are you serious, Clark? <laughs> There's one in my in my province, actually. No kidding. Mm-hmm. Father Aquinas Beal, who's uh, currently at uh, one of the campus ministers at Johns Hopkins University in Baltimore. Do you guys have like rock paper scissors contests or like? Well, he's like, the prior. That's right. So, like, <laughs> yeah. Oh, I guess the community yeah. took care of that for me. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> they just elected me prior, and that's it. Yeah. Really funny thing that happened in this room not too long ago. Adam and Juan were going to have a rock paper scissors contest. I don't even remember what it was about. But Juan, right before they did it, he goes, "I'll just let you know, I always throw a rock." <laughs> and Adam looked at him like. You could tell it's just like right. a total mind <laughs> job <laughs> on Adam. He's like, are you serious? This or is true, like, yeah. Are you yeah. playing me? Cl- what, like, what do I do now? Are you about to throw scissors? <laughs> yeah. Because you know I'm going to throw paper? Is that what... Is, you know what? He threw rock. It was like so funny. The whole thing. It was the best. It's an honest man. <laughs> right. It's like, I was just sitting there as a spectator going like, this is incredible. I always... This is the quality stuff that happens right. to your father. I always throw rock. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Temperance. 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 We're talking about temperance. So, okay, so we, we kind of touched on the cuspel. Mm-hmm. Maybe we'll brush on the ras- raspable and then mm-hmm. talk about how to develop, how to continue sure. to develop it. Mm-hmm. Okay, so a raspable appetite, go. Yeah, so those, again, are, you know, whenever we've got some uh, some difficulty in, we encounter some difficulty when uh, in pursuing the, the good that we have set out to uh, to attain, if it's threatening to us, such that the the continued pursuit of the good might cause us harm. Mm-hmm. The response is fear. 
you know, uh, or if it's just something that is, um, you know, aggravating, slowing us down, uh, delays our our uh, our uh, our enjoyment of that good. That can be anger, you know. It and can you see be the sorrow. B- oh, sorry, I didn't you know. Uh, yeah. But uh, and so those are you know other kinds of reactions. It could also spark in us daring, you know, that uh, that uh, instead of being patient and enduring, we we attack. Uh, is daring and, a negative? In no, this sense? no, it's it's positive because okay. I mean, it, after we um, because I could see it in either way. After we of. evaluate the situation, it could be prudent, you know, that we in fact uh, attack it. But Aquinas right. says that in fact the the the, the larger part of uh, of fortitude is actually enduring our fear. Yes. Uh, yeah. So that we don't, because of that fear, uh, fall away from the just pursuit of the good. Mm-hmm. And here for him, the icon of of the the courageous person is the soldier you know who on the battlefield because of the the nobility of the objective uh, endures the fear of putting his life at risk in order you know for the for the objective objective to be right. to be won um, and so that's why we we hail the the soldier and the courage of the soldier uh, in itself but also see that as the the real model and example yeah. of what fortitude is that's what don quixote says it's better to err on the side of recklessness than cowardice yeah, I mean, if you got to err on one side, right? I mean, because at least, yeah, that that there's still action towards the end. Yeah, yeah. that that you're not shrinking away irrationally, but um, yeah, attacking obviously, it maybe irrationally. Obviously, don't err on either side. Right, right. right. You know, but, but if you had to, right. yeah. But no, you I can see, see that. You can see. I can see the, what he means by that. Sure. And you can see the bridge that happens. How, how these both can be attacked, right? When you get angry, sometimes that falls into lust or uh, fear. Right. You sometimes you. Uh, eat too much to the right. to, to point of gluttony like they they can kind of bleed into one another sure and you also find in the opposite uh the remedy so for uh you know the sorrow that may come from uh disappointment or frustration uh the proper enjoyment of food or drink could be you know a remedy for mm-hmm. that uh or for anger you know the the meekness that that's proper to to temperance you know could could be uh you know a remedy uh, just to make sure that we're angry in the right kind of way mm-hmm. or um the humility that that's proper to to temperance can also uh shape uh our our desire to or temper our desire to to do great uh and noble things that we do them not simply to be recognized or uh you know become famous by by what we do but we we pursue it because of the nobility of the act itself because the good should be itself achieved uh and that i i I pursue that especially if i'm capable of of attaining great goods that i do that with with humility so father um you know one of the greatest pursuits in life is that of Mm -hmm. self-mastery temperance is a huge fundamental fundamental part of this you know Mm -hmm. the four cardinal virtues obviously Mm -hmm. um and i i don't think that i'm different from most people in this in this regard that i find it much easier to either fast you mm-hmm. know, absolute, you know, just abstain, mm-hmm. then, you know, I cannot eat three M&Ms. Right. You know what I mean? <laughs> I just can't do it. Um, and I know that if I were perfectly virtuous, I, my appetites, I would not desire that which was more than I should. Mm-hmm. You know, I, that I would be able to satisfy 100% of my desires and it would be just right. Um my desires are not there, right? And so how is, how can I, how do I get there? You know what I mean? Like, I, I know that it's a ver- it's a habit. I need mm-hmm. to like somehow practice it. But even right. in saying, I'm going to limit myself to five M&Ms, that I understand is a, that's probably part of it. But I'm still in that sense, not, does I, you still I still this. desire more. Yeah, it's almost you know easier I mean? just but to that's say, okay. no, I'm not going to do any of okay, it. Okay, so that's okay. Well, I mean, because it's not going to happen immediately or, 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 or uh, you know, immediately overnight. Um, so on the one hand, um, I think it's to, uh, to recognize, first of all, that uh, if we indulge the immoderate movement of passion, we're only going to get more of the immoderate movement of passion. Okay, <laughs> you know, that makes sense. In any, in any realm. Yeah. So... If you can't eat uh, only five M and M's, but it's always going to be fifty-five right. <laughs> M and M's. Well, there's uh, so not that many. Every so time, <laughs> every time you eat fifty-five M and M's, you're going to continue to want fifty-five M and M's. And so, 
uh, you get smart about it. You, you come up with a plan. You attack it. You know, mm -hmm. uh, in in a rational kind of way. So, um, what is it like then to only have five M and M's? So you see, you have five and you stop. Walk away. Do to I eat something them else in one bite? <laughs> or five <laughs> separate one M and M. I would say separate. Yeah. Okay. I would. I would start. Prolong there. it. Right. Okay. Yeah. Make it string it out and then okay. stop. And then there's going to be a kind of delight there. I mean, from you've had the chocolate, but then uh, because you had a moderate amount, mm -hmm. a rational amount, maybe that's six, also going to maybe six maybe would six. be a, a more prudent number. <laughs> Seven is a perfect number. Well, this is where you're going to start getting yourself. You in see trouble. what I'm doing? Yeah, and it's, yeah. It's in, this is it. No, right you here. you you set a plan and you stick to it, and over time there'll be an experience of the delight of having a rational, reasonable, prudent amount of of yeah. pleasure. Uh, and you'll begin to delight in that more than just gorging yourself, absolutely satisfying the base and base, I should say basic, just sense pleasure for um, the satisfaction of, of the sweetness of the, the candy. But also, and Aquinas says this, it's, it's the feeling, it's the, the sense of touch in the stomach because it's full and more than hmm. full. Uh, we have to get to a point where we experience the, the delight and pleasure of, of the moderate amount, and we have to like that more than the, the feeling of being gorged. Hmm. And however we get there, you know, uh, that, that's the first step. Right. Uh, and then uh, over time, yeah, you'll, uh, you'll become more and more satisfied by the delight of the moderate amount and more and more, in a sense, disgusted by the, the feeling even the idea of the of the immoderate amount. So th that so that's the I think that's uh, important to know about what what the m temperate movement of the passion is. It's it's not for Aquinas uh, the the cessation of passion or the quashing of passion, mm -hmm. uh, the absence of passion. No, it's it's the right movement of that passion towards the right kind of satisfaction of the passion. So the 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 temperate man is the one who prefers. Yeah, the fine meal to, um, yeah, the quick thing from Burger King or, or, yeah. or McDonald's. Sometimes that's necessary, but you prefer, you know, nutritious, well-prepared, and well-set well, well set kind of food. It's it's the one who, as you were joking at the beginning of the show, it's the one who prefers Torbeg to Bud Light. Right, you know? right. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and also in the in the in the realm of 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 sexual pleasure, it's it's the it's the husband who takes absolute delight in his wife. Uh, and enjoys her company, uh, especially in intimate moments, and right. is in, in fact in all kinds of ways. In all kinds right, of yeah. ways, and then is in fact repulsed by even the idea of enjoying that pleasure with anyone else, right? Um, or outside of her, in general. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, and and so that's uh, that's a sign that you've you know that's what temperance looks like. It's yeah. the, it's the man who who enjoys all of these goods and all of these pleasurable goods. Uh, according to right reason, which is say according to also to his circumstances, state of life, age, marital status, you know, yeah, uh, you know, uh, all, all of those things go into helping to determine what is is prudent and rational. One of the him. things that I've been reflecting on, or it certainly was at the very beginning of Easter. I was kind of looking back on my Lent. Um, I just what I did I, last year. I did Exodus ninety. This year, I kind of adopted the practices of Exodus ninety during mm -hmm. Lent. And what I decided is that for next year, instead of abstaining from from these things, I'm going to do exactly kind of what we're talking about. Mm -hmm. um, if there's a social setting, I will have one beer. Right. I will not abstain from beer. Mm -hmm. I will not abstain. I will have one. Mm -hmm. And you know that if you're at a birthday party like for four hours, right, it's hard to have one beer. Right. Do you have it right away? Do you wait? Like, right. Put it off an hour. <laughs> you know what I mean? Uh, but like to do that. Instead of, because I don't have an addiction, I'm not addicted mm -hmm. to chocolate. I'm not addicted to these things, right? And so I don't actually need to, abst mm -hmm. you see what I'm saying? Right. I think that's what I'm going to do next year. It should be harder. I think it will be harder. Yeah, because I, I would rather just not have any exactly. than have just a little. It's right. Right. zero or gluttony. Like, those are the easy I ends got lots of, of thoughts spectrum. on that, especially how it, how it appear, uh, applies to Lent. But uh, well, okay. we might have to save that for another show. Well, 
after this how about that for we're done, we're done with the radio <laughs> section the podcast will continue right after this if you have a few minutes sure. to share your thoughts with us so uh, if you want to hear father aquinas's thoughts go to the catholic man show.com download our podcast we're on the lord's team the winning side so raise your glass and cheers to jesus cheers this is perfect this is perfect i'll cheers you one <laughs> oh, you want some? More? Oh, you'd like a little bit more. Mas por favor. Yeah, I mean, you'd yeah. have to almost do that, but, but you'd also have to be giving. I mean, it's. Well, yeah, you, just like a, a warm up, as they say in the fresh in, co- in coffee world. Yeah, that's fine. Yeah, that, that's plenty. Thank you. I spelled a drop two it's times. Okay. That's alcohol abuse. So what? So <laughs> so what were your thoughts on that? So I do think that there is something that uh, people approach Lent. I think by and large. I mean, with the best of intentions. So this isn't yeah. to uh, uh, to fuss at or um, yeah to to denigrate anyone, especially in their Lenten practices. But I, I think it there is something that uh, the way people approach Lent as a kind of feat of strength that um, and it doesn't have any real value outside of proving either to themselves or to others or maybe to God. You know, just how strong they are. Like mm. I love you enough, you know, not to have this pleasure for 40 days and the the concentration is so put on not failing in the penance such that if you fail in the penance like lent is is busted great you know, you know? you're yeah. done you're, all right that's, yeah yeah whatever and so like the idea that you would like sundays aren't included in kind of what your lenten penance like is is anathema to them because um well that that's breaking your penance you mm-hmm. know um i'm glad you said that because it's like but it's never. Oh, I I don't do it on Sundays. So. Right, that's right. Well, no, but I mean, it was never. I mean, that's why Lent is longer than technically forty days because the Sundays were never counted right. or included. Right. Uh, now, it doesn't mean you go hog wild, you know, yeah. on on Sunday. But it's it was recognized that uh, it's the Lord's Day still, and it's it's not a day of it's Easter of of uh, of, of I mean, maybe your fasting. Sundays look different right. in Lent than they do in Easter. Exactly. You know, but whatever. But. Um, but I think the pressure that people put on themselves about not failing in their penance is is an indication that um, there's a misunderstanding of what what this is for, you know, uh, in terms of denying ourselves certain pleasures to to grow, to open up the the soul and the spirit to to prepare itself to celebrate, you know, Easter, you know, well. Uh, and so I think this kind of approach to penance, where yeah, it could be seen as as a moment where I try to grow in, in temperance, and the way to do that is is not simple, abs- complete abstinence, but but teaching ourselves um, to to enjoy the, these pleasures in a more moderate, temperate kind of way. Yeah, and it also avoids the ostentation of uh, that that many people <laughs> experience in Lent, like to go to a party and say, "Well, yeah, I'm not gonna, I can't, you know, have all that." Well, what is Right. It's the that holier ju- than thou. Like, that just shows look at that, me. You know, look, at, look at what I, I can I'm, do. Yeah, I'm fasting, and therefore, right. you know, especially if you're the guest and someone has offered you this in charity, and right. you, know, you say no because, uh, well, that's especially if they made dinner because you were coming over, or they right. made dessert because you were coming over, right? right. And just like, say, oh, I'm yeah. sorry, I can't. That I happens can't. all the time on Fridays, right? You go to right. a, a, a non calix friend's house, and uh, you get there, and you can just smell brisket on, you know, and you're like, oh no. You right. know, right? But yeah. it's That's not easily avoidable, though, by simply telling them like someone ahead of time. Yeah, ahead like just time. so you know, like I don't eat meat on Fridays. I'm Catholic, and it, it right. actually opens up a great conversation, right? right? Uh, but if if it's the last minute, you know, right. like it's happened to me several times. The, like, right. I'm just gonna and do the it. The church in her wisdom gives you other options. Other options, right. you know? yeah. And it's like I'll just do something else. Yeah. And it's not because I want to. Eat maybe meat, for a lot of people, eating the meat is the sacrifice. Like, <laughs> right. like they're freaking out about it. You know, or kind I mean? of mortification. Yeah, of that can correct a, a kind of improper sense of what right. the the Lenten practices are for. Yeah, I don't want to like over uh, kind of emphasize the or overstress uh, the yeah the, the the error here or give it more or, or importance down, than it has. Downplay right the penance. Uh, right. Yeah. That's right. But it's like uh, yeah, there is a. I think there's a lot to learn from the church's fasting laws as they exist now, especially looking at uh, not the exceptions, but uh, the the mercy and the charity that the church employs in, in directing the life of penance. Uh, it can seem overly indulgent, especially if you compare it to other traditions or even earlier practices. Uh, but uh, I think there's a lot of wisdom in terms of building up uh, virtue that, mm-hmm. that, that informs the, the church's practice now that... Yeah, we can tend not to appreciate if 
we only see these practices again as, as kind of feats of strength. Right. Well, you know, uh, Father, we live in a time of plenty. Mm-hmm. We live in a world of easiness. Uh, men are made, we're made for difficult, arduous things. That's why right. we're strong. Mm-hmm. That's why, you know, uh, there is nothing hard in the life of an American. Mm-hmm. You know, you wake up in your, on your memory foam bed, right. you know, in just like absolute comfort. Uh, you get out and you're climate controlled. You take a hot shower, mm-hmm. you put on your luxurious, cl- you know, like cotton clothes have never been as awesome as they right, are right. today. I, I don't know if you know right. that because you wear this like just lovely habit, but a wool uh, blend, right? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, like the undershirts that they have today, nothing like they right. were like when I was born, right? Uh, and so, like, you get in your car, you Which go is drive also to your climate office, controlled, right. right? Exactly. It's like the. I don't think that like a hundred years ago, men were excited to mow their yard. I get excited right, to right. mow. It's like, oh yeah, I get to do like this. Is a, I'm gonna be a man today, you know. Like I didn't, I haven't been a man the other days. Of the right, week, right. You know. So uh, I think the same kind of thing applies to Lent. That mm-hmm. oh, finally, right. I get to do something that I was made for. Like mm-hmm. I'm gonna do something hard. It's a, kind of a sign of the time. Mm-hmm. And I just know that in my own life, my desires, my appetites, they're not formed. Mm-hmm. I have disordered appetites. I know that about myself. Mm-hmm. So I need rules. So I think that if if my appetites were formed, I could use Lent as a time where I would actually go against, you know, like what my appetites were. But instead, mm-hmm. I have to use Lent as a time to try to form them. Mm-hmm. You know, it's like this is a, right. a good a good time for me to like set extra rules for myself. And when I when I approach Lent, I try to do it in such a way that when I'm done with Lent, I'm actually gonna have a habit that I mm-hmm. walk away with, right. right? No, I think that's a much better approach to Lent than... Uh, and I, I, That should be part of one's goal uh, when entering Lent is to choose a, a kind of penance, as, as you said, that, that one can take with yeah you can take with you uh take with you after you know lent is is over you carry over you mm-hmm. know into the to the rest of the year at the same time i would want to say that um yeah lent is not like the catholic new year which is to say that this is when we kind of work on our resolutions right. for self improvement sure. um or it shouldn't only be that i mean that right. could be a, an element of it but it really is i mean it, it's it's the period for the believer who should already be seeking all year long growth and virtue and living the life of grace mm-hmm. uh, but that's intensified uh in the weeks of lent in order to prepare for the the celebration of of easter there's something we read in the office of readings in the very first week of lent i forget who uh it, it, it's uh by but just making this point Let, let's not forget that uh, uh the whole of life is a life of penance mm-hmm. <laughs> it should be you know the whole sure. of life is uh a life of, of growth and virtue uh, deepening one's prayer, deepening one's cooperation with grace. Uh, and that's intensified in Lent because of the intensity of the church's celebrations of yeah, Easter. Sure. Because of those, because it's it's the Sunday of Sundays. Uh, you know, we have the preparation mm. of preparations, mm-hmm. you know, in, yeah. in that time. So um, that's the other reason I don't like the, the kind of feat of strength idea about Lent, because it, it says that, well, it's only during these weeks that I, I do this the rest of the year. You know, I'm soft. It's a, it's a free for yeah. all. Yeah. yeah. So uh, it was Exodus 90 that really taught me. Mm-hmm. I mean, it, which uh, I did Exodus 92 years ago, and now I've continued. I fast on Wednesdays and Fridays. Mm-hmm. You know, like it taught me. I've said this so many times in this podcast. Exodus 90 changed my life, mm-hmm. big time, um, and I think that. If my appetites were formed and I desired the right things, mm-hmm. my Lent would be so much different. Mm-hmm. You know, but I know that it's they're just not. Yeah. And I, I'm trying to form them. I don't know. I, right. I, I don't know that I'll ever, I'll probably die with unformed <laughs> appetites, right? Yes. Um, yeah. I'm glad you said that. <laughs> not that it's not possible for the Lord to right. like. But it gets right. easier, right? As you continue, it, it's the, the initial going through the trenches of, yeah. of forming the appetites that it, that's the heart as mm-hmm. you continue to see the true the good the beautiful of the virtuous life it becomes easier to live that virtuous to strive for yeah. that 
So let me ask you this, Father. Mm-hmm. For someone just like hypothetically, you have a, a man who um, he's not new to the Catholic faith. You know, he knows the faith, but he you know struggles to. He he wants to he wants to be holy. He's pursuing holiness. Mm-hmm. He's pursuing Christ. What is a good Lent? And I just I'm right. talking about a, a man in general, so mm-hmm. you know it's difficult for you to answer. I understand. Right, right, that. right. What's your What's your answer? I think it's following just the the church's counsel. It's again what she what we read on on Ash Wednesday, <laughs> in uh, in in the gospel, the gospel that's put before us. It's some kind of some combination of of three things: prayer, fasting, and almsgiving. Mm. So the prayer gives it obviously its spiritual orientation. Uh, one meditates on, on the Word of God and converses with God. Uh, deepens one's faith by making acts of faith. Uh, hopefully, in a newer and deeper way, uh, one enters more into the communion of truth with God, uh, which is the foundation. As, as Aquinas says, that's the beginning of eternal life in us, and so that it, you have to begin there. Um, so, deepening faith uh, and uh, undertaking the prayer that that strengthens faith. The fasting is there, in fact, to support the prayer. <laughs> you know, because the the more that oh, we okay. are. Uh, the more that we, in a sense, deny ourselves and empty ourselves, that's the whole of the, especially the desert tradition, is uh, that it's the emptying ourselves of, of the earthly pleasures that we attune the soul to enjoy and delight in more spiritual pleasures. Uh, so, so the fasting creates the room in life for, uh, for, for prayer. So not only are we eating less, spending less time eating uh, by denying ourselves those, those pleasures, we we, in a sense, sharpen our, our spiritual senses because um, we're not so, in a sense, inebriated by physical pleasure. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, we we can, uh, you know, rely more or become more sensitive to, to spiritual pleasures. Mm-hmm. And then the almsgiving is uh, how just uh, because maybe there's a way in which we can com- become overly self-centered in our prayer and in our fasting. Uh, almsgiving helps us to, to recognize that. We're con- we continue to be social creatures. Uh, that charity remains the, the the greatest of the theological virtues, uh, and that whatever benefits we receive from our prayer and our fasting, uh, the fruits of that need to be shared with others. Yeah, um, there's also a sense of security, you know, that you have in. Oh, I have a savings account. When you start right giving it away, right. You know, like you start to. You're no, you're no longer relying right. on yourself, but right. you. you it's, right. a sense it, it, of, it's very. It's like a very obvious, like, oh, who is it that is? Where do I get my security from? It's not because I have a bank account, right? right? It's, and it loosens our grip, our, our kind of greedy grip on, yeah, yeah the the possessions that we we might yeah. rightfully acquire and rightfully enjoy. Sure. But um, but there can be an attachment to them that robs us of uh, greater expressions of charity. Almsgiving is uh, definitely my weakness in Lent. I just, I give the same amount uh, mm-hmm. in Lent as I do. Uh, yeah. it, well, you should try to be a little holier. Have uh, you tried that? <laughs> 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 Let's talk about that. <laughs> command, command me, <laughs> my friend. Well, this, I think, is where Aquinas can be helpful, too, because the way he talks about uh, almsgiving is not just about giving money to the poor. Okay. For him, uh, almsgiving is, is the... The general category, which encompasses every act of mercy. Oh. Uh, so for him, the the corporal and spiritual works of mercy, all of them fall under under almsgiving. Really? Yeah. I did not know that. Yeah. And so I think that's a healthier way to, to see that it is not just about giving money to the poor, but performing the 14 acts <laughs> that are recommended by Scripture huh. uh, in terms of... Uh, and they're both corporal, which is to say physical... Uh, but also spiritual. Uh, you know, they have their origin in the soul and their benefit in the in, in the soul. And and really, the the point of of almsgiving is is to make us more merciful. Hmm. And in that, recognizing more and more how we are the the recipients and beneficiaries of the Lord's mercy, um, and the only response we have to that uh, is is to show mercy ourselves. Uh, and that's almsgiving. That's beautiful. The last thing I want to say is just a comment on a point you made just a minute ago. I have noticed in my in my own prayer life, the days like I t- I pray in the morning. It's the first you know mm-hmm. when I get up, um, I, I just I, I pray for about thirty minutes. The days where I have fasted, the, I should say the mornings where mm-hmm. I fasted the day before, I tend to find I have 
a, a more, in, uh, you know, I, I don't want to judge my prayer life based on the way I feel mm-hmm. about my prayer, right? Mm-hmm. Um, but I tend to feel more intimate. Mm-hmm. The days where like, oh, wow, uh, we had like a birthday party yesterday right. and ate like two pieces <laughs> of cake, right. you know, I don't, I, there's just a, like a, I don't feel the same. Mm-hmm. And, you know, part of that I, I realize is that we're body soul composites mm-hmm. and my body is an instrument mm-hmm. and my i experience the lord through my body mm-hmm. i cannot experience right. him apart from it right uh and so if i have while you're alive well, at least well yeah and you know like right now that's where right. i'm at you know so yeah, yeah. if i have if i'm not as sharp my the, the instrument of my body or what i don't know the best way to say it but you know, it, it, it interferes. Right. I think the Desert Fathers knew that. They're, they're the great teachers of this, that uh, when, when the senses and the desires of the senses are constantly satisfied by pleasure, mm-hmm. uh, that, that dulls our spiritual senses. That's right. I just don't because, feel as sharp. I'm because dull. life becomes simply the pursuit of the next sensual pleasure. Yeah. You know, the next physical pleasure. Uh, and you're not concentrating at all uh, on the uh, on the higher goods, higher pleasures, spiritual pleasures, and in fact, don't even have the energy for it because yeah, um, yeah we become slothful. You know, it's, uh, it's we're, we're dragged disorder. down. You can, and I can feel it because it's not just when I eat too much or when I drink too much, when I don't get enough sleep. Right. Uh, if I'm tired, I, mm-hmm. I kind of have that same. There's like some a barrier that is in the way, and it, it's. I think it just flows from a lack of order. Right. You know, I should have gone to bed on time. I should have. Um, I I, pri- right. I was. It comes down to me prioritizing lesser goods over higher goods. Yeah. I think know? health experts, scientists, others who study nutrition and other things are rediscovering. I think uh, an earlier wisdom. Uh, I mean, the whole interest in intermittent fasting. I think it's just uh-huh. simply rediscovery of how it is that people, for centuries, yeah. in fact, ate. Saint Anthony is still in the <laughs> desert, going like. I told you guys. I've been here right, right. forever. <laughs> <laughs> but recognizing that there are not only spiritual benefits but to that, but also physical benefits yeah. that we're not built like yeah, to have the stomach we're full not supposed to feast all every the day. time. <laughs> yeah. And so I find that interesting actually, because mm-hmm. I think it confirms something that the wisdom that has um you know been carried on through in the spiritual tr- tradition yeah. uh, of the church, which is a reflection of an, an earlier just practical wisdom as to to how to live yeah. uh and uh so that i think there's something to that uh and that there's something uh, even physically beneficial about the kind of extended experience of of hunger not to the point of uh, harming oneself or emaciation sure. <laughs> or, or sure. things right. like that right but uh, but that uh yeah even sleep patterns, uh, also, uh, just the way um, that what we're rediscovering about about especially the medieval patterns of sleep may be more natural than than what it is that that we do now. What did they do? They got up in the middle of the night. Uh, mm-hmm. Yeah, they they yeah, had see. like two cycles of sleep, but but they weren't, which we do too. Uh, Kramer did this for a while right. in an episode of Science. <laughs> Science right? I don't know if you remember that. Like, <laughs> yeah, and he turned out. It not it didn't, it didn't turn out well. It didn't work out for Kramer, but also Kramer wasn't a real person. Right, right. <laughs> yeah. But it seems that uh, people went to bed at sundown uh, okay. and uh, and got it's up four hours like, later. They didn't have electricity exactly. Either. So I mean, what are you going to do? It's time, you know. There's no <laughs> more light. You well, can I only can't burn see, so <laughs> You only burn <laughs> candles for so long. Right. Yeah. And uh, we have one candle. <laughs> what are we going to do? You know. And you went through one maybe four hour cycle of sleep, and and you woke up. And people kind of piddled around uh, in the middle of know, the night? in the middle of the night, and this is why I, I think the midnight office of monastics make a lot more sense. Uh, not to say that there's no that's not a penitential quality to it, because that was the longest office uh, of the day. It was, uh, yeah, they would be in there for a long time. Uh, uh, but then when you gotta have that memorized, memorized too, because you have like because yeah. you're in the dark <laughs> yeah. with your one candle. Uh, but then you went back to sleep after an hour or two. Went back to bed and back to sleep and slept another cycle. Was uh, it one hour or two? Because that is a big difference. Oh, well, I think it was I'm three thinking. or four. I mean, I think people still probably got seven to eight hours of sleep or even more. But there was a there was a pause in between, oh. and uh, and uh, yeah. I think uh, I could do that one time. Right. 
Like more now, than that, for would us, get, it would get. I, it would be so annoying. You right. know what I mean? But I think that was just their their natural rhythm. Whereas for us, uh, I mean, if, I think if you start going to bed at seven o'clock, <laughs> okay, okay, yeah, you're, you're gonna right. wake up at midnight, right? yeah, uh, and then you'll be tired again at two, and you'll sleep till six, uh-huh. you know. Uh, and uh, so they didn't have a nap. They didn't have the siesta. Pro- well, that's a good question. Uh, they probably still did. Oh, only because it's probably in those areas where the siesta developed. It was just so hot in the middle of the day, and oh, and you brother. also had your main meal in the middle of the day. I was just contemplating, brother. Yeah. Right, right. <laughs> <laughs> so, do you guys call each other brother or friar? Or what do you call uh, each other? By our first names. Okay. But t- yeah, in a more formal setting, father or brother. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Just curious. We're all friars. Friars. Yeah. Yeah. Right on. Any, any of the, the, I'm, I can no. keep asking questions, but I'm gonna, no. <laughs> in temp, I'm gonna temperate, I'm gonna, t- what is, what's the word? It's the present tense word for temperance. Like I'm going to temper, you're, temperate myself. You're, a t- uh, temper, temper. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> Duh, that's, I'm gonna temper myself. <laughs> Thank you. The words, temperate person tempers himself. Words are hard. <laughs> That is our motto. And our, and it's our one, of, it's is, one of our things. Is like we just it's beyond hard. math is hard. Words yeah, are yeah, hard. Words are hard. <laughs> have you I ever like studied that. Latin? <laughs> I do have a quick question. Oh, Juan has a question. Yes. Here we go. Other than St. Thomas Aquinas, who do you recommend reading for? No one. Matters of te- Next question. Oh, you weren't asking me. I'm so sorry. <laughs> I'm so sorry, Father. For, for matters of temperance, who, which saint do you think has good words of wisdom? Oh, gosh. Um, go to St. Thomas's teacher, uh, St. John Cashin, you know, who was uh, fifth century. Somebody's going to correct me if that's wrong. Uh, so he was a Westerner uh, who went to the Middle East and to Northern Egypt and lived with the desert monks for a long time, acquired their wisdom, uh, and then went back to, to Europe, uh, founded monasteries there. Uh, and uh, and wrote later in life uh, all of his experiences and all the wisdom he picked up, you know, speaking to to these the desert fathers and desert monks. He's moderating a bit because he's writing for a different audience, a different people who live in a different climate with different temperament, different expectations. So it's 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 the the desert tradition already translated for weaker <laughs> Europeans, <laughs> our ancestors. Mm-hmm. Uh, but it's very interesting. I mean, uh, St. Dominic read Cashin every day. Aquinas read Cashin every day. Uh, and I, I think that's what you find there is the, the soul of, of Dominican spirituality. I am so uh, unfamiliar with him. Yeah, yeah. I and uh, just in I've terms only of, heard of him. I, I find him enriching for two reasons. One, uh, he has an insight into human psychology that is phenomenal, um, especially for that age. But I think a lot of people... They they paid attention to what happens <laughs> interiorly, uh, and uh, and came into came uh, developed profound insights into yeah our own psychology, uh, but then develops lots of practical suggestions on how to you know because this is the problem and and puts his finger right on it this is this is how you deal with it, uh, and so his two works the institutes is the shorter one the conferences are much longer. Uh, but in both works, you'll find uh, just a master at diagnosing our spiritual ills and uh, and, and, and suggesting the, the remedy. And that's, if you are familiar with St. Thomas and read St. Thomas a lot, and you're also familiar with Cash, and you read St. Thomas and say, okay, well, this is, <laughs> you can identify those those that elements that, that he's, to... he's pulling from Cash. Nice. Yeah. Great Thank question, you, Juan. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I had no idea. Father, we can maybe end with your blessing. How does that sound? Sure. Yeah. All right. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Heavenly Father, send your Holy Spirit upon us. Fill our minds with your truth, our hearts with your love, and bless us. Inspire us, encourage us, strengthen us in our pursuit of you. Deepen daily our exercise of faith, hope, and charity, so that in this life, but more so in the next, we may know, love, and serve you for all eternity. We ask you this, God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. It was a pleasure. Thanks so much for hanging out with us. My pleasure. Thanks again. Thank you, Father.